Hey there, folks. My name is Dan Goodman, and I want to welcome you to Stormwind Studios' succinct held online remote training sessions, or shorts, as we like to call them. This is the fourth short in the Wireless LAN Essentials series of shorts, focusing on ports and interfaces. So as far as our main topics are concerned, we're going to talk about some basic terminology. We'll get into the Wireless LAN controller ports, discuss link aggregation, take a look at the wireless LAN controller interfaces such as the management interface, the virtual interface, and dynamic interfaces, and then finally close things out by taking a look at interface groups. So the first thing to get through is going to be our main terms. Now providing different services to different wireless users requires segmentation of the physical and logical traffic flow. Got it? Good. <laughs> Moving on from there. Here we have a basic controller to help us identify the various ports and interfaces it has. Now keep in mind that the amount and type of physical entities, otherwise known as ports, are going to vary based upon the controller model. But for the most part, the logical entities or interfaces are going to be pretty standard. Now, ports provide the physical connectivity to the wired infrastructure. Interfaces create the virtual connections to the network. The service set identifier, otherwise known as the SSID, identifies a wireless LAN. Basically, the SSID is the name of a wireless LAN you see from your laptop, smartphone, tablet, whatever it may be. Now, most folks will make the mistake of thinking that the wireless LAN represents a wireless network, and in some cases, it does. But when you're talking about wireless LAN from a wireless LAN controller's perspective, you almost want to think of a wireless LAN as being an organizational chart, if you will. Uh, it's going to include the interface that is used for the SSID, any of the configurations for that interface, things like your VLANs, your encryption, your authentication, your port security, whatever it may be. So in many ways, the controller definition of a wireless LAN is very similar to a VLAN. You don't want to make the mistake of saying, oh, I walked into Starbucks and I saw the Starbucks wireless LAN. It's kind of correct, but really the wireless LAN is the name of the network plus all of the things that make up that particular network. Now, most of the ports can have multiple interfaces assigned to them. Some ports have a specific purpose and cannot have an interface assigned to them. So focusing in on the wireless LAN controller ports here for a second, here we have the Cisco 3504 wireless controller with its main components labeled. And we're just going to go in numerical order here from 1 to 16. Uh, the first one is going to be the service port LED. The second uh, bubble, we'll use that term, is going to be the redundancy port LED. Bubble number three is known as the service port, which gets abbreviated as SP. It is an RJ45 port that is used for out-of-band management and is controlled by the service port interface. Just remember, the port refers to the physical thing you plug a cable in. The interface is the logical representation of that physical thing. Now, the service port is also used for system recovery and maintenance. This is also the only active port when the controller is in boot mode. This port cannot carry 802.1Q tags and requires connection to an access port on a switch as opposed to a trunk port. Now the redundancy port, bubble number four, enables the use of a backup controller. Controllers can be directly connected to each other or connected through an intermediate switch, thereby providing high availability, redundancy, failover, those sorts of things. Bubble 5 is the console port via a RJ45 connector. Console 6 would be the console port via a mini B USB. Keep in mind that only one of those console ports are available at any given time. Bubble number 7 is the USB 3.0 port that is used for software updates. You can also do your updates uh, via FTP or HTTP 
or you can load them to a USB drive, plug them in, and have them update the system that way. Bubble number eight is going to be your data connectivity port. Ports nine through 12 are distribution ports that connect the controller to a na uh, neighboring switch to establish a data path. Uh, that means that port nine is a gigabit ethernet port, port 10 is a gigabit ethernet port. Port 11 is gig ethernet with power over ethernet out. Same thing for port number 12, gig ethernet with power over ethernet out. Bubble 13 is going to be the reset button. Bubble 14 is the system LED indicating that the controller is powered on. 15 is a alarm indication LED. The alarms themselves are view viewable via a console screen. And then finally, bubble 16 is the high availability LED. The next thing we want to get into is going to be link aggregation, otherwise known as LAG or LAG. This is actually a partial implementation of the 802.3 AD port aggregation standard. The distribution system ports would get bundled into a single 802.3 AD port channel. Redundancy gets added into the mix while reducing the number of IP addresses needed for the controller ports, hence the name aggregation. We can combine multiple ports together without necessarily having to assign an IP address to all of them. Now the redundancy itself is going to be dynamically managed by automatic fail, failure recognition and traffic migration. Load balancing on the access points is also provided and is completely transparent to the users. When we talk about the actual wireless LAN controller interfaces, we want to go back to this diagram here for a minute. The interfaces, once again, provide the logical traffic flow. Now, some interfaces are static and configured at setup like the management interface, the AP interface, and the virtual interface, as well as the service port interface. Other interfaces are gonna be dynamic and set by the administrator. Since they're dynamic, they are called dynamic interfaces. Now going back to the management interface for a second, this is the controller's default network facing interface. It's usable for in-band management of the controller. The internal clients can connect to this interface's IP address to access the controller's graphical user interface, or GUI. This provides connectivity for various services provided by the controller or an external device. It can be used for things like AAA for client authentication, Cisco Discovery Protocol, DHCP for clients, SNMP, inner controller communications, and access point discovery. Now, this particular interface must be in a different VLAN and subnet than the service interface since it is the in-band interface. The AP manager interface controls the access points attached to the controller. It's going to be equal to the number of ports on the controller itself. This, this is also going to be the source address for all control and data traffic to and from the access points. The next interface is the virtual interface, which is responsible for mobility management, DHCP relay, layer three security, such as web authentication, otherwise known as web auth. Every controller that forms what's called a mobility group needs to have the same IP address for their virtual interface. Now, mobility groups are gonna be a discussion for another day, but in a quick one-liner, they provide seamless roaming for our clients. Now, this must be a, a must be an unassigned, unused IP address that usually falls in the 192.0.2.0 range. The next interface is going to be our service interface. Let me say that correctly, the service port interface. This is used for out-of-band management, similar to the in-band management interface. This does require an IP address and a subnet that is different than all other interfaces. It is connectable, if you will, via a straight through to a switch or a crossover cable directly connected to a workstation. Now, the other interfaces, as I alluded to, are dynamic and set by the administrator. These dynamic interfaces 
are essentially the interface that gets dedicated to a specific wireless LAN. Now, depending upon model, controllers can have upwards of 512 dynamic interfaces. These dynamic interfaces include built-in support for multiple VLAN instances. Now, the interfaces themselves can be logically grouped together to form what's called an interface group. Now, the interfaces can belong to multiple groups at the same time, but the wireless LANs can be assigned to an interface group just like they are assignable to an individual interface. Now, the group members must have a different name than the interface group name. So I can't call the group wireless LAN controllers and then add a controller that's called wireless LAN controller. It has to have a different name than the group name. Now, one thing to mention here in closing is that we've obviously mentioned subnets a couple of times during this discussion. Definitely a recommendation to brush up on your subnetting skills if you are considering taking a certification exam. Those of us who could care less about the certification exam can rely upon a handy dandy subnetting calculator and use that to our advantage. All right, folks, that's all we had here for our short on wireless LAN essentials. Make sure you subscribe to our channel to be notified of our future shorts. Take care.